the Cosmos take on the national team of Cuba from Havana. The historic occasion, a very high magnitude event. Just by the body language, of the anticipation of the game. As for the business at hand here today, fans began packing Estadio Pedro Marrero over four hours before the kick. And the average price of admission, 25 cents. And we're underway. Cubans were asking me, you know, how has this island been for you? Do you enjoy it here? I begin a new chapter. Traveling to a country, breaking barriers, pulling people together. The experience itself is what's going to stick with me for the rest of my life. How far has the apple of Raul fallen from the tree of Fidel? This is yet another step in the normalization of relations between these two countries. Cosmos take on the national team of Cuba Today, the United States of America is changing its relationship with the people of Cuba. You know, the headline was, you know, the, the diplomatic relations were going to open up between the U.S. and Cuba. And the first thing that popped into my head was, well, soccer. And instead, we will begin to normalize relations between our two countries. Well, the day that the uh, president announced that he was going to relax restrictions for Americans traveling to Cuba, we contacted the Federation immediately. It turned out those officials were in Jamaica. As luck would have it, Gio, our head coach, was going down to Jamaica, and the Cuban Federation was going to be there. The relationship just took off. I've received the call to me, the good friend. Well, for me, it's a surprise. My friends say, come on, the Cosmo will go to the Cuba. I, I question, for what? It's, my friends say, hey, it's possible a friendly match in Havana. Wow, really? Excellent. Everybody in Cuba surprised. Any person say, it's not possible. Yes, the Cosmo is coming to Cuba. And in the first few minutes of the game, uh, Cuba really went at us. I was surprised by the Cuba team in the first half. A little bit nervous, tactical, and uh, some players with uh, a lot of good, uh, good skills. They had several chances. Quick to Reyes, turning, looking for the shot. We kept thinking the ball was going to go disappear into the jungle. One probably did, as some of their shots went wide and over the bar. We had trained on it the day before, and it was, you know, a typical hot, dry day, and, and the field was, you know, pretty bumpy, a little out of shape. Just to be the first soccer team or sports team to have been over there, I think it was more than 16 years, was, you know, it was an honor. You could tell that the guys were excited and we had a little more energy about us, and I think that showed in, in how we opened the game. Ever since I was a child, I was dreaming to see the Cosmos play in Cuba. Cosmos, the best uh, international team in the USA, um, footballistas Pelé, Raul, Beckenbauer, Senna. We have a legacy that we have to uphold, the, the legacy of the, the Cosmos with Pelé and Beckenbauer and Canalia. I mean, everybody remembers what a global phenomenon the Cosmos were. This is actually the 42nd country that the Cosmos have played at. We take the cosmopolitanism part of our mission very seriously, and uh, so it was rather fitting for us to go to Cuba. The Cosmos, of course, tried to get to Cuba in the 1970s, and by the time the invitation came through in 1978, our general manager, who had been pestering them, Clive Toy, had left us and gone to Chicago Sting. So Chicago Sting got to be the first soccer team to visit Cuba from the United States. Maybe the first globally famous team filling stadiums here and, and barnstorming around the world. And they've, they've maintained that, that personality. And they've been in six countries, I believe, in the last two years. 
So that always opens the door. When you put a good team on the field the way we have, with great players like Marco Senna, Raul, then you can walk through the door. This was a, a completely different level, you know, the, the diplomacy that was added to it. Cosmos got their touches on the ball, worked the ball around. Kasana off the turnover, quick shot, and Kasana is on the board. Cosmos lead. Raul was involved in the play, I think it was a bad clearance uh, by the defender, and I just uh, picked the spot, I put it behind the net. So in the ninth minute, the New York Cosmos take the lead on the road in the form of Lucky Kusana. There's no way I could, I can like come up with to express how, how much I felt at that moment. It was a sense of tremendous relief. We'd come here, after all, to play soccer. And we wanted to put on a good display. This would be a game that people would talk about for generations. One of the things we thought would be very special was to put our team on a plane, put media on the plane, put Pelé and any other celebrities that come along, and to put our fans on a plane. It was a bit risky and certainly costly to charter one plane. My name is Gabe Oppenheim. I live here in Chelsea, in New York. And I'm a full-time writer. When I heard the rumors, and they were at first just rumors going around soccer circles, that the Cubans are gonna play the Cosmos, it's gonna be in Havana, I straight up sent an email to Eric Stover, the chief operating officer of the team, and I said, just get me a seat on that airplane and I will find a journalistic outlet to pitch this article to. Rolling Stone just seemed like a good place for an adventure type story that I wanted to be the sports version of Almost Famous. This team has a historic background of partying, so that's where the idea came from. Cosmos do have this rich history with these great famous players. These Cosmos were owned by Warner Music and the victories were part, you know, were celebrated at Studio 54. I didn't think the current Cosmos were those people. I'm not gonna mistake those guys for the guys in the late 70s. I am Dave Martinez, the everything of Empire Soccer. Technically, I'm the president, uh, but I'm also the editor-in-chief. If I cover you know, the Red Bulls, New York City FC, the Cosmos, it's a historic occasion. It's a foray through sport in diplomacy. How do you miss out on that? You can't. I had to be on that plane. Two people behind me in the line go, that's Carmelo Anthony. And I look and I see a tall guy, but you know, he's 40, 50 feet away. So I turn to them and I say, that's not Carmelo Anthony. Cause wh why the hell? Cause we were on the same plane, but all the journalists were in the back. Are you talking Carmelo Anthony? Is, it, is, he on, is he getting on this plane? And then I look over and I squint, you know, they're saying it's Carmelo. And you get closer and you're like, oh yeah, that's Carmelo. Once you take a seat, you start seeing all these different people. And there is, you know, Pele with his mouth agape, uh, eyes rolled back, snoring, and the right of me is Carmelo Anthony popping bottles. The plane became a big party. Carmelo was there because he's going to constitute a new NASL club uh, in Puerto Rico. So from that point on, all, all, be all bets were off. Anything could have happened. I swear half of me was thinking, I'm gonna see Jay-Z and Beyonce. We're going to a land that we're really not allowed to be in or haven't been allowed to be in for a very long time. You can now literally fly out of the airport named after the guy who tried to overthrow this entire enterprise in Cuba, JFK, who is going to forever be linked to the failed Bay of Pig invasion and also the Cuban Missile Crisis because politically we had been such enemies that there had been an invasion on our part, essentially, to overthrow their government. You know, we were landing in Aeropuerto Jose Marti, which is named after the great liberator Jose Marti, who fought to free Cuba from Spanish rule. That's funny, because on the plane was Raul, a great Spanish playing legend, you know, Senna, who led the Spanish side Villarreal, and Ayose, who also obviously played in La Liga. So you've got the three best players, essentially, on the team are Spanish stars, and we're landing in the airport named after the guy who freed Cuba from the Spanish. 
You don't want to reduce a trip that has a lot of political complexity because there are obviously Cuban exiles in Miami whose lives were destroyed by the separation enforced by Castro. And you see that destruction. We all remember Elian Gonzalez. He had family in Miami fighting to keep him there when his mom died on that raft and family in Cuba fighting to bring him back. And he was ultimately brought back. So you don't want to reduce a situation that is so fraught with, with sadness to like a cool little jaunt. We were not Dennis Rodman and this was not North Korea. We weren't unwitting pawns in some master chess player's game. That being said, we were rock stars. We were, because here we are, we come down in a chartered jet with Carmelo and Pelé. Carmelo is a great player. Pelé is the acknowledged, you know, best player ever. We come down to this island with, with Raul, who's one of the best Spanish players of the last 25 to 50 years, for three days with a contingent of global press. Hell yeah, we were rock stars. The first 10 minutes were the hardest. The heat was hit, really hitting us. We were glad that it started raining because the humidity was just insane. Drop back, Zatella. Got it down by Raul. Right in front of the goal by Guanzante. All the attention was on Raul. I did a given goal. I crossed it. Raul saw me in the second post. He headed it down for me, and it was an amazing feeling. Guanzante announced to come in Cosmos. soccer as a form of making a connection. We produce their Cosmos Copa, which is their signature community event. Cosmos coaches and players are big volunteers for us. And that's what we do every day here in the United States. And we're able to go to Cuba and achieve the same thing. Uh, we're here with around with 50 kids. We're showing them some skills. Right now we're doing this 3B1. And you know, it's fun for the kids. A lot of kids, that they have it really good. Sitting there speaking to folks, and you realize like maybe their first interaction with the United States. And the kids were great. I mean, they were super attentive. I was super impressed with their aptitude. Kind of got uh, the messaging. And the coaches, you know, kind of got the messaging too. We were there to make an authentic uh, community connection and, and to be ambassadors, and I think we you know, achieved that. Sports diplomacy is symbolic. Symbols matter, and also when you interact with the supposed enemy in a way that is not about politics, but it is about culture, sports, history, food, music, you discover the depth and the richness and the diversity of the humanity of the people on the other side. My name is Ted Henkin. I am a professor of Latin American Studies and Sociology at Baruch College, City University of New York. Our governments certainly have been enemies and have had a long antagonistic relationship, especially the last 50 years. But the peoples of Cuba and the United States really aren't responsible for that and don't really share in that. We are good in baseball, boxing, high jump, running. In football, we are very, very bad. In Cuba, there is no money for the soccer. The baseball player, they can go out, you know, for U.S. to to try to find a better life, you know. But the soccer player, nobody can do that. The Cuban people don't have internet. I don't have TV international. But for me, uh, there is a problem, you know, because uh, between Americans and Cubans, you know, the people between between people is, uh, you know, we are friendly. The Americans love, love Cuba, the Cuban love, love you, you know? But the politics is another thing. But maybe if the life will be better, maybe it's better, it's for them, not for us. Because for the people, there is now nothing. This is a very unique moment in time in terms of our being able to see Havana 
in this transitional phase. We've seen the pictures of the old cars in the, the beautiful buildings, many of them crumbling. But to actually be there, touch them, see them, it, it was remarkable. It sort of reminded me of, of going to East Germany in the early 1990s as they were just making that transition. Yeah. Here we were in 2015, uh, looking at a Havana that uh, hadn't really had any improvements uh, since the year of Meyer Lansky, whose ghost seemed uh, present at every corner. We had a chance to go out and, and roam around and meet people who weren't associated with the game, and very pleasant people. They welcomed us. That's when you start to realize that there's, there's hope here. And so there was this incredible exchange. You weren't just representing yourself. You were representing New York. You were representing soccer. You were representing America. So literally wake up, think it was a dream. Hunter Freeman got a ball, whipped in a really nice cross to Diosa which he was in the far post and Diosa hit it back in to the six yard box and that's where I was uh, there at the right time to put it in. The Cosmos have gotten another one with Tarishian and they made it a three nothing score line. Just getting that goal in front of all those fans was just unbelievable. They're getting better as the game is progressing. In Cuba, the National Sport is uh, baseball. Cuba is a, is a baseball nation. I think people, for the most part, accept that, understand that. It's important to remember that there was a huge influence from the United States to Cuba during the first 60 years of the 20th century, especially in sports. Cubans were, in some ways, the most Americanized of all Latin Americans. That's why baseball is the national sport of Cuba. In Cuba, probably for the longest time, it was baseball was the way out, get onto the national team, travel the world. Now you bring soccer in, and that is not just sports. It's an opportunity for the young people in Cuba. Football in that nation has grown so much. You see it on the streets, you see it with the kids playing uh, and just about anywhere. I'm not sure it's going to replace uh, uh, baseball, but, but uh, the most popular among the young people is football. Listen, the baseball is politic. Okay, this is national sport. But for us, it's not important the baseball. You don't need very much equipment to play soccer. You need a field, you need some kind of a goal, and you need a ball. You can even play without shoes, right? Baseball, they know the rules by heart, but you do need a lot of equipment. I think that soccer has this kind of international universal appeal because of the simplicity of the game, but the complexity of playing it well. I love to the future for the, the, the Cuban football. We have many boys in the game. They also look at uh, the stars, you know, uh, playing soccer, so they want to become like them. You know, they say, oh, I'm Ronaldo, I'm Ronaldinho, I, you know. I think it was fitting that with this restoration of diplomatic relations, that it was a soccer team that arrived. I think it speaks to the new generation of Cubans and, and their openness to the rest of the world. So what better way than the global game? Football is the best play, the best game the world, in the world. It's the universal. It's my opinion. <laughs> That's ugly. Kicked ahead, right sideline for Guanzati. That cross, Casada, 4 0. Cosmos. And as good as this is for the Cosmos, the Cuban national team better get their defense sorted out. I saw the ball was kind of Kevin wet too, so I think that kind of made it difficult for the goalie. It's becoming a horror show for the Cuban national team. Well, the crowd is enjoying it, I think. But when it got to 4 nothing, there was definitely a, a kind of down feeling among the fans. Maybe we need to just, like, you know, 
just a little bit of respect for them and just just go for a jog and like hug each other. Meet at the score goal. Get a goal. Get one. Don't get shut out here. The Cuban national team locker room is going to be an interesting one, I would think, at halftime. For me, it's special because I am Cuban. Um, my parents are from Cuba. I was born just three weeks after my parents arrived in the U.S., so it's always been special for me. I'm the son of Cuban parents, Cuban immigrants. Cuban immigrants slash exiles could take their sons and daughters, American-born sons and daughters, with them to Cuba. My mom took advantage of that, and we went to Cuba. I saw the land. I saw the natural beauty of Cuba the Pearl of the Caribbean. Fortunately for me, I've been able to come three times now, all of it because of work and because of sports. 1999 with the Orioles, 2008 during the World Cup qualifier against Cuba, and now the Cosmos trips. For me, this is long overdue, the normalization of relations, and by no means are we there yet. Riding the subway, reading the New York Post, I look down, and there's a blurb, Cosmos, uh, Cuban national team today. I get into work, I immediately call one of my close cousins, and it led into a little bit of a little conversation about whether it's good or not. We were both on the side that it's a good thing eventually for Cuba. It's, it's the first kind of breakthrough that's necessary, and, and sports always seems to, to be there the, in an emotional moment or a breakthrough moment. And I think it, this may be one of those where you actually look back about 10, 15 years from now, and, and everyone points back and goes, hey, that, that kind of was something that got this going, that started to really thaw out the relations. They want normalized relations. It does take time. It takes a lot of time from the time that you just start to have conversations to the time when you truly have full diplomatic relations. So in that sense, you know, you have to take baby steps. You have to crawl before you can walk. The morning of the match. We're all in the media room getting the word out there of, of what we're seeing in Cuba. And all of a sudden from the back of the room you hear a reporter just jump up. Oh my goodness, what what happened? The shocking news we had from FIFA, the sports governing body. Is that why stepping down as the president of FIFA? Talking about potentially the most historic week in the history of the planet's most popular sport. That he could hold governments to ransom. Sepp Blatter just resigned. Obviously Sepp Blatter announcing his resignation is huge news in the in the world of soccer football sure enough the world of soccer was changing when we woke up on match day I was disappointed that it was raining and raining as hard as it did I saw the stadium you're assuming it's gonna be something palatial huge wonderful beautiful Instead, what you're greeted with is a, a pale blue facade with the words Estadio Pedro Marrero uh, crudely put on top and a little statue of somebody's head in the front. Estadio Pedro Marrero is dug out into the landscape. You head into the gates. It's a long path down. It's a stadium that was built in the 1920s. It was more like you're on a riverboat in the Amazon. And then there's this enclosure, and suddenly inside the enclosure is like a unexpected tribe or some major event you never could have seen coming. People were painting. There was a, there was a mad dash after training to paint the stadium to uh, to paint some of the grass I'd heard also. Well, the trees and the rain and the humidity. I feel like the apocalypse now analogy is a pretty good one because it did feel like there was this small little thing, a field and two grandstands that had been macheted out of a jungle. Seamus O'Brien, the, the chairman of the team, he had had this idea that he was going to dress the Cosmos in beautiful custom white guayaberas, you know, the Cuban shirt with a, a Cosmos logo. So I'm hanging out in the lobby, and then suddenly and the team comes down in these like, you know, luminescent white guayaberas, white pants, all of them. And they posed on these little steps in the lobby, like three rows, and they were all just decked out in white. You could see the looks on place, uh, especially on a, a, like Raul's face and several of the others. 
they wanted to play. They just wanted to get there and play. They had enough sort of the build up. They wanted to go. The atmosphere along the way as we had the police escort, there were Cubans you know, on the streets waving to us as we approached. When I got to the stadium, which was probably around three something, and the game's at five, there was more and more, not intensity, but excitement and, and excitement of an unpredictable kind. You're in a tropical setting, it's raining, you're in a vintage stadium, there's creeks, there's water falling down from the stands, like a movie set. It was a, a soccer romantics uh, fantasy. And yet, as we turned the corner and saw the Cuban fans, suddenly that sense of hatred that you get from the conflict of the great derbies went away. What I saw truly breathed life into that stadium were the people. It, that was the pulse. It was just amazing to see American flags waving in that crowd at us. Our fan seats were in the front row near midfield. They came in as a group all wearing green, so they had to walk all the way down one aisle at the end and then across the front of the whole stadium. And the Cubans stood up and cheered for them. The signage, the t-shirts that they were waving, never seen anything like it in my life. And those people were lining up by the thousands outside to get in through one tiny gate, and they made their way in, and they were singing and chanting and dancing and, and celebrating the moment. I got here at 1 p.m. today, and there were already hundreds of people under the canopy waiting for the game, and that's a good four-plus hours before the match started. There was that guy with the Cuban flag and American flag sewn together, and some of the Cubans booed him, some people cheered him, just float in the air and it was it was just symbolic of what we were doing. It just captured what we were trying to convey there. There was every type of sign, Raul equals leyenda, legend. There was that guy who had the American flag with the letters, President Obama, please let me see Steph Curry play. I did not know they would know who Steph Curry is. They spoke directly to our to our president in Cuba. Didn't know they had the freedom to uh, to express themselves in that fashion. The music, the festivity, just the, the unbridled passion that they exhibit. I think the fact that Blatter resigned on the day that the Cosmos are here in Cuba only helps. It was bigger than Seth Blatter. So why concentrate on the worst in life when you have the best right in front of you? In this moment, we have good national team. I wouldn't say work class. But the, the guys are the guys are fighting. We have good goalkeeper. And the attacking, Michael Reyes, good player, big player, good ability, and the young player is Arturo Dispes. The team captain Marquez has been around for many World Cup qualifying cycles in his early 30s. Uh, there's not a lot of video on the players. Uh, they elected to play some younger guys, guys they see as the future of their national team. It was, it was so unexpected, the youthfulness of the crowd. So when they switched to that American national anthem and did it so flawlessly, I, it was, it was, I guess the, hopefulness is one word. It was the, it was almost like a triumph for pure emotion over bureaucracy in a way. I couldn't believe it. I mean, I, first of all, I couldn't believe we were actually playing in the U.S. national anthem in Cuba. I think if you're an American and, and you had a dry eye, then uh, you might be soulless because it, I, I was tearing up. I've had journalists tell me, you know, I'm here to cover it and I'm crying. But it sort of reached its climax at the stadium where just, I don't really know if that's the right word, love, but there was just a, it was a welling of emotions that kind of came to a head. The importance of the relationship between the two cultures really came out in that moment. 
I shouted it, and uh, it was really obvious a few notes in that the Cuban people were singing it with us. And at that moment, I stopped thinking about bladder. I stopped thinking about all the corruption of soccer. I stopped thinking about all of that because it didn't matter. Here we were and seeing the very best, the purest of what soccer can be in uniting worlds. And at that point, journalistic distance or, uh, or trying to keep objectivity goes out the window when you're witnessing something that beautiful. Look at things in the context of what Cuba was during that week. Sepp Blatter, all the all, all the controversy happening around FIFA. It's the ugly side of the game that finally got exposed. This is the true power of soccer, not what's happening in Europe, not what's happening with the leadership of FIFA. The crowd was hanging on every moment because they knew this moment was fleeting. They don't know if it's going to come again, but they're happy that it's here. With that comes an appreciation for every minute of the match. When Raul was tripped to the ball, it must have happened two or three times. The crowd erupted as if, oh my goodness, you know, this, this god of soccer was just stripped to the ball by one of our own people. At the beginning of the game, I, the Cuban national team was playing very well, surprisingly well. Then you could see the influence of the Cosmos and, and probably overall better talent start, start to show. They kept fighting. They played with heart and with character, and that's what we expected, so that was part of the theater. That was, I thought, more than shoulder to shoulder. Push back, Macaro shot, and they've got one. Cuba has scored thanks to Macaro, 4-1. Finally something to celebrate. second half. You know, I thought that was a great moment for the fans because there was a sense after the first couple of goals that the Cubans were seeing something great that they wanted to see. It was worth sticking around for the second half and seeing the Cuban national team score and, and get one on the board. You felt like everyone there was cheering for both teams at the same time. So when they got that goal back, it, to me it just it gave them something that they could hold on to. You know, this one memory we scored against the Cosmos. For me, that was one of the highlights of the match, for the Cubans to have a chance to celebrate their team. I like boxing for a lot of reasons, but one of the things that I like the most is two guys will wail on each other for 12 rounds, or in the old days, 15. And then the bell rings and they hug each other. When you've done battle together in that ring or on this pitch, you transform from competitors, ultimately, into essentially partners. They looked at it as a spectacle, and as, a, as an event, as a happening. As, uh, as a change that has finally hit their island. You were getting memories. Before the game, you could tell when Pelé was out on the balcony, that was a moment that was a snapshot in their head. It reminded me when uh, Pelé said on his retirement, October 1st, 1977, he said, love, 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 love. When I was a kid watching that, I didn't know what he meant. Love, and love. He waves to them and he touches his heart and he, and, and he can't get them to stop shouting. I felt like I finally got it for the first time there in Havana. The love that greeted Pelé, the love that greeted us. There's something special about the global game. There's something special about soccer. That ball comes around and it just erases differences between cultures. Sport is peace. Sport is health. Sport unites peoples. It would help to build a bridge. Sports has always been a bridge. And I think you're gonna just start to see more and more openness, and I think sports will be at the forefront of that before the true relations are normalized. We have to start building a new era and building a bridge of friendship, prosperity together and more teams will come to Cuba to play. 
You know, what about the Cuban people? Cuba could be overtaken by the tsunami of investment, of speculators. This is not a culture to stomp like a brick. This is a culture to exchange and to share with others, but at the same time to remain being Cuban. And so they need to create an economy and a society that will give incentives to young people to stay in Cuba and see a future in Cuba versus seeing their future in Madrid or Miami or New York. I would say that that's kind of, the Cold War never ended in Cuba and December 17th was in some ways the beginning of the end of the Cuban Cold War. And you felt like you were building that bridge. You felt with every handshake, every hug, every exchange with anyone there. And there will be bumps in the road. There's no doubt about it. There always are. I, I just think, you know, when you look at the only communist nation in the Western Hemisphere, it's time. It's a trip of a lifetime. I'll never forget it. I, I want to go back. If someone said go back now, I would. It was a, a special moment, no? All the uh, feeling and the, the people, very, very kind, uh, very lovely. And uh, I would like to, to come back to Cuba with uh, all my family. I really expected some kind of anti-imperialist, anti-American sentiment to come through, and quite the contrary. Um, it was that we're all Americans. 